have your Bible, you turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verse 4. We're talking about foundations, and this morning we're looking at our one foundation, the number one. Ephesians 4, starting at verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. If we're going to discover God, which is our theme this year, then we have to be united in doing so. Some of us can't be over here looking for God, and some of us over here looking for something else. We've all got to be looking for God. In fact, I believe discovering God depends on us all being on the same page. A number of years ago in Canada, a two-year-old girl wandered away from her neighborhood. It was a cold, wintry day, and her parents realized when she was gone that uh, they needed to probably find her pretty quickly. And so they, they advised all the neighbors in the neighborhood that uh, their daughter was missing and asked for their help. Well, the searchers saw some footprints in the snow, but there were a lot of footprints in the snow. And so they were all kind of going off their own way, trying to find this little girl. And they did this pretty much the rest of the day, and it was getting close to dark. And one of the men suggested, why don't we all join hands together and go through the field as one, and maybe we'll find her that way. And so that's exactly what they did. They all grabbed hands, and they started walking through the field like that. The tragic way they found her, she was frozen to death, all curled up. One of the men said in anguish, oh, if we'd only join hands sooner. And maybe we would have found her. Being united and working as one is important, but there is a difference between unity and unanimity. And we need to know the difference. Unity is when we're all on the same page, unanimity is when we're all alike. There's a big difference. Look at it this way. Look at it as a, a, an orchestra. Maybe our, our band over here. You know, they're all playing the same song, but they're not all playing the same instrument. They're playing different notes to make the so sound good. And that's unity. Because they're all on the same page. They're all playing the same song. Unanimity would be if they all had the same instrument and they all playing the same notes at the same time. Now that can make music, but it's not nearly as good as the music that's made by an orchestra that's united, playing different notes at different times to make the sound even better. In our text today, Paul is telling us that if we're going to discover God together, then we have to use the same sheet of music, the same score of music. And that means that we may not all be playing the same instrument, but we're playing the same song. You see what I mean? That's unity. And that's what we must be about if, we're, if we really want to discover God. Paul here gives us seven foundation stones that make a solid foundation for us as a church that we can be united together in. The first one is one body. When Paul talks about the one body, he's, he's talking about church. He's not talking about a local congregation <coughs> as such. He's talking about the church that's, that's everywhere. The church that's universal. The one body is made up of people everywhere who have obeyed the gospel, who have 
followed the commands of Christ. And, you know, you can see that not every local church is, is going to have the same order of worship. Not every local church is, is going to do things quite the same way. But we're playing the same sheet music. We're on the same uh, song. We're playing the same thing. And so in that sense, what Paul's saying here, that the church, wherever it is around the world, it's united. It's definitely not the same, but it's united because we're all following the same gospel and we're preaching the truth and we're obeying the commands of Christ. That's what makes the church Christ's church. When we do what Christ has said to do, we can maybe do it in a different way, but it's doing what Christ has commanded us to do. It's important for us to understand that our salvation is not based on whether our names are on the roll books at a church someplace. Our, our salvation is based on whether we are obeying the commands of Christ. It's that simple. It is important that our name is on a book somewhere, and that's the Lamb's Book of Life. And if it is, then we are in that one body where Christ is going to return to take us all home someday. Paul also mentions one spirit. There were many so-called spirits in the days of the early church. The same could be said, I think, for us today. There's a lot of spirits out there in the world. And people are following a lot of crazy things. The Holy Spirit, however, is what Paul had in mind. And that's what he was concerned about. The Holy Spirit has a specific role in the world today and in the church today. That role is to convict people of sin. And to convince us that when we're not doing something that's right, that we're, we're, we're correcting it, and making it right. The Holy Spirit is the comforter that Jesus promised us before He went back into heaven. He said He would be sending us the comforter. And He told us what this comforter, this Holy Spirit, was to do. He said the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth. That's exactly what he did, John 16, verse 13. To discover God, we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit directs us. The Holy Spirit is our spiritual conscience, helping us to know what's right and what's wrong. We received the Holy Spirit when we were immersed into Christ. Peter said in Acts 2, 38, that when we repent and are baptized in the name of Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins, so we receive the Holy Spirit as a gift. And in Romans 8, 16, it says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Spirit, He is helping us, verifying for us that we're in this body, the church, the church that knows Jesus Christ and follows His commands. We're in one body, we're in one spirit, and Paul also says here, we're of one hope. One hope of our calling. Any hope that we have, I think, is tied to the promises that Jesus is one day coming back. And the hope that we have is that Jesus is going to keep that promise. And the reason we have that hope that He is going to keep that promise is because we have seen all the other promises that he made that he kept. In fact, there's not a promise that Jesus made that he hasn't kept other than he's coming back. And so we believe he's going to keep that one too. And that is why we can have hope. There's one hope that Paul's talking about here. Hope is about something that's definite, something that you can count on, something that you can take to the bank. Because it's going to happen. It's true. Hope keeps us on schedule. Hope keeps its own schedule. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but we believe that He is. And 
that's our code. James 5, 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. We just have to hang on to hope. Be patient. Because it'll happen. Because God said so. Jesus is coming again, or parousia, as it's called, is certainly, even though we don't know when it will be, it's certainly going to happen. And our living in hope causes us to live a holy lifestyle. Because whenever it happens, we want to be ready. And so we live like it is happening maybe today or tomorrow. And if it does, we'll be ready. So keeping this hope helps us to live a kind of life that's pleasing to the Lord. We live in hope with an eternal anticipation of the future. Because even though we don't know all about heaven, we know it's going to be great. It's going to be better than this world. And so that's great hope to have. Paul also says there is one Lord. Acts 4, verse 12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is only one Lord that we can be saved by, and that is Jesus Christ. Paul used the term Lord here, I think, to show us the position that Jesus has to have in our lives. He has to be number one. He has to be first place. He has got to be the one and only Lord that we have. He must be our master, our ruler, the authority for our lives. No one else can save us but Him. Jesus is our Lord. He, that's His name. We call Him Lord. He's also Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, the one who went to the cross for us. That's his title. In the Roman world, there was peace, the Pax Romana. They brought peace to, to all the world, pretty much, that, that was known. The Romans had a, a way of doing things that when they conquered a country, brought peace to that country, they took all the, the gods and the idols of that country and they had a special place for them in the Parthenon. And that way, any of the citizens from that country that could go to the Parthenon, they could go in there and up on a shelf somewhere, I assume, they would find their little idols to their gods. And then, so they would, they would feel at home in this, in this new Roman Empire. Pan means many. They would realize that there was all kinds of gods here that could be worshipped. All kinds of idols that you could give your allegiance to. But there's something interesting. The Romans had a problem with the followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, when the followers of Jesus Christ were arrested, oftentimes they were arrested for being known as atheists. Because they wouldn't recognize any of those gods. So they figured they didn't recognize anybody. They did recognize, however, they had one Lord, and that was Jesus Christ. Making Jesus your Savior, that's the easy part. Making Him your Lord, that's the hard part. You know, making Jesus your Savior. That's a, that's a very special one-day, one-time thing. Making Him your Lord is something you have to do every day. Every day you get up, you have to decide that the boss of me is going to be Jesus, the Lord. He's going to be the one in charge. He's going to be the one calling the shots. He's going to be the one who has all the authority. He's going to be the one helps me make my right choices. 
And that's not always easy. Because we find ourselves getting in the way. And he slips out of being the Lord. Because we take over. So making him Lord, that's, that's the tough part. That's where we struggle. But that's something we <coughs> must do. If he is our Savior, we also must make him our Lord. By obeying what he said. And doing what he's commanded us to do. He's not only our, our Lord, but Paul talks about Him being the one who has given us this one faith. One faith that we are following. There's only one way. There's only one faith. There's only one life in this foundation. And we must make sure that it's ours. God revealed this one faith to us in His, in His Word. And it contains the doctrine, the truth, the things we must, must believe, the things we must obey, the commands we must keep. The body of all that we believe is called our faith. And we're always building on this faith. You know, remember the story Jesus told about the mustard seed? If we have faith just as tiny as a little mustard seed, that can grow into it great big tree. I see us as maybe having different stages of growth, but we all started out with a little bit of faith, like a mustard seed. And now we're trying to nourish that faith. We're trying to encourage that faith to grow and become a tree, become even more than what it is now. In Jude, verse 3, Jude only has one chapter, but verse 3 it says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. That word contend, interesting word. It means we are giving all out effort to build our faith, to make our faith what we envision it to become. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm not there yet. I'm not the mature Christian I want to be. I'm further along than I was, but I'm not there yet. And so I'm contending earnestly for this faith because it's that important to me. He also says, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. That's a pretty important phrase there because what that means is that what we got in our Bibles is all we need. There isn't going to be any more delivered to us that we need. We've got it already. And it's all we need. One faith that we're supposed to be growing in. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. A workman who does not need to be ashamed handling accurately the word of truth. See, this, this faith has been handed down to us. It's a very special faith. We must guard it, we must keep it, and we must pass it on to others. That's how valuable it is. The word workman there, I don't know what you think of, but to me, when I hear that word, present yourself, prove to God as a workman, that means i got to do something. I can't just sit back you know, wait for Jesus to come. I got to do something. I got to be working. I got to be using this faith so that I share it and give it to other people. It's so one faith that's pretty important. He also talks about one baptism. I think this is the baptism that Jesus was talking about in Mark 16 16. Jesus said, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. You know, when, when the early church started, there were many baptisms around. The baptism was looked at as an initiation rite. And so you might be baptized just to get into some club or group or something. But there's only one baptism that saves you. And that's the one Paul is talking about here. 
He is saying that baptism that saves you is immersion. Acts 2.38 again answers the question that people ask on the day of Pentecost. What shall we do to be saved? Peter said, repent. Let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism Paul was talking about. It saves us. Same baptism Jesus was talking about. And if we believe and are baptized, we shall be saved. There was only one baptism that the Bible gave that we received the Holy Spirit. And that's the one he's talking about here. This baptism is the only one that contacted the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Because Immersion, baptism, is dying to your sins and being buried in water and then rising up out of that grave. So it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's the one baptism he's talking about here. And the last of these seven foundational stones that he talks about is one God and Father. One God and Father. We're all brothers and sisters here today because we have the same Father. When we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, that made God our Father. And Jesus our brother. There are not many gods, and there are not many ways to heaven. There's only one. Our God is the one in three. You know, the, the Trinity is here in this passage of Scripture, even though the word Trinity is never found in the Bible. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is seen here. Interestingly, Paul says in verse 4, there is one Spirit. Okay, there's the Holy Spirit. One of the three parts of the Trinity. And he also says in verse 5, that there is one Lord. Talking about Jesus. So there you've got the Holy Spirit, and you've got Jesus the Son. And then here in verse 6, he talks about there is one God and Father of us all. So you've got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here in this passage. Tell me to say, yes, the Trinity certainly is important. This passage ends in verse 6 by saying that God is over all. He's through all, and He's in all. He is the one God, one Father, who we need. So there truly is one foundation that we need to stand on, and it's these seven things that's talked about here. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. The question is, do we acknowledge God as the one and only Father? Do we acknowledge Him as the one who has all that we need to know about? Do we accept Him as the one true God? Do we accept His Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord? How is your foundation? Is the one foundation that we must have yours? It's this one foundation that we stand on that's going to get us to heaven. Do you have that one foundation? Because it helps you discover God. This morning we're going to sing an invitation again. It's an opportunity for you to make your foundation more solid. We sing this song. Maybe you need to make a decision to accept Christ or to make this your church home. But I know each one of us needs to make a decision to, hey, I'm going to make my foundation more solid than it was today. Make that decision. As we stand as we sing.